This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot, as read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk. www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com. Chapter 70 our deeds still travel with us from afar, and what we have been makes us what we are. Bulstrode's first object after Lydgate had left Stone Court was to examine Raffles's pockets, which he imagined were sure to carry signs in the shape of hotel bills of the places he had stopped in, if he had not told the truth in saying that he had come straight from Liverpool because he was ill and had no money. There were various bills crammed into his pocket-book, but none of a later date than Christmas, at any other place, except one, which bore date that morning. This was crumbled up with a hand-bill about a horse-fair in one of his tail-pockets, and represented the cost of three days' stay at an inn at Bilkley, where the fair was held, a town at least forty miles from Middlemarch. The bill was heavy, and since Raffles had no luggage with him, it seemed probable that he had left his portmanteau behind in payment, in order to save money for his travelling fare for his purse was empty, and he had only a couple of sixpences and some loose pence in his pockets. Bulstrode gathered a sense of safety from these indications that Raffles had really kept at a distance from Middlemarch since his memorable visit at Christmas. At a distance, and among people who were strangers to Bulstrode, what satisfaction could there be to Raffles's tormenting, self-magnifying vein in telling old scandalous stories about a Middlemarch banker? And what harm if he did talk? The chief point now was to keep watch over him as long as there was any danger of that intelligible raving, that unaccountable impulse to tell, which seemed to have acted towards Caleb Garth, and Bulstrode felt much anxiety, lest some such impulse should come over him at the sight of Lydgate. He sat up alone with him through the night, only ordering the housekeeper to lie down in her clothes, so as to be ready when he called her, alleging his own indisposition to sleep, and his anxiety to carry out the doctor's orders. He did carry them out faithfully, although Ravels was incessantly asking for brandy, and declaring that he was sinking away, that the earth was sinking away from under him. He was restless and sleepless, but still quailing and manageable. On the offer of the food ordered by Lydgate, which he refused, and the denial of other things which he demanded, he seemed to concentrate all his terror on Bulstrode, imploringly depreciating his anger, his revenge on him by starvation, and declaring with strong oaths that he had never told any mortal a word against him. Even this Bulstrode felt that he could not have liked Lydgate to hear, but a more alarming sign of fitful alteration in his delirium was that in the morning twilight Raffles suddenly seemed to imagine a doctor present addressing him, and declaring that Bulstrode wanted to starve him to death out of revenge for telling, when he never had told. Bulstrode's native imperiousness and strength of determination served him well. This delicate-looking man, himself nervously perturbed, found the needed stimulus in his strenuous circumstances, and through that difficult night and morning, while he had the air of an animated corpse, returned to movement without warmth holding the mastery by its chill impassibility his mind was intensely at work thinking of what he had to guard against and what would win him security whatever prayers he might lift up whatever statements he might inwardly make of this man's wretched spiritual condition and this duty he himself was under to submit to the punishment divinely appointed for him rather than to wish for evil to another through all this effort to condense words into a solid mental state there pierced and spread with irresistible vividness the images of the events he desired, and in the train of those images came their apology. He could not but see the death of Raffles, and see it in his own deliverance. What was the removal of this wretched creature? He was impenitent, but were not public criminals impenitent? Yet the law decided on their fate. Should Providence in this case award death? there was no sin in contemplating death as the desirable issue, if he kept his hands from hastening it, if he scrupulously did what was prescribed. Even here there might be a mistake. Human perceptions were fallible things. Lydgate had said that treatment had hastened death. Why not his own method of treatment? But, of course, intention was everything in the question of right and wrong. And Bulstrode set himself to keep his intention separate from his desire. He inwardly declared that he intended to obey orders. Why should he have got into any argument about the validity of these orders? It was only the common trick of desire, which avails itself of any irrelevant scepticism, finding larger room for itself in all uncertainty about effects, in every obscurity that looks like the absence of law. 
Still, he did obey the orders. His anxieties continually glanced toward Lydgate, and his remembrance of what had taken place between them the morning before was accompanied with sensibilities which had not been roused at all during the actual scene. He had then cared but little about Lydgate's painful impressions with regard to the suggested change in the hospital, or about the disposition towards himself which what he held to be his justifiable refusal of a rather exorbitant request might call forth. He recurred to the scene now with the perception that he had probably made Lydgate his enemy, and with an awakened desire to propitiate him, or rather to create in him a strong sense of personal obligation. He regretted that he had not at once made even an unreasonable money sacrifice, for in case of unpleasant suspicions, or even knowledge gathered from the raving raffles, Bulstrode would have felt that he had a defence in Lydgate's mind by having conferred a momentous benefit on him. But the regret had perhaps come too late. Strange, piteous conflict in the soul of this unhappy man, who had longed for years to be better than he was who had taken his selfish passions into discipline and clad them in severe robes, so that he had walked with them as a devout choir, till now that a terror had risen among them, and they could chant no longer, but threw out their common cries for safety. It was nearly the middle of the day before Lydgate arrived. He had meant to come earlier, but had been detained, he said, and his shattered looks were noticed by Bulstrode but he immediately threw himself into the consideration of the patient, and inquired strictly into all that had occurred. Raffles was worse, would take hardly any food, was persistently wakeful and restlessly raving, but still not violent. Contrary to Bulstrode's alarmed expectation, he took little notice of Lydgate's presence, and continued to talk or murmur incoherently. "'What do you think of him?' said Bulstrode in private. "'The symptoms are worse. You are less hopeful. No, I think he may still come round. Are you going to stay here yourself?' said Lydgate, looking at Bulstrode with an abrupt question, which made him uneasy, though in reality it was not due to any suspicious conjecture. "'Yes, I think so,' said Bulstrode, governing himself, and speaking with deliberation. "'Mrs. Bulstrode is advised of the reasons which detain me. Mrs. Abel and her husband are not experienced enough to be left quite alone, and this kind of responsibility is scarcely included in their service of me. You have some fresh instructions, I presume?' The chief new instruction that Lydgate had given was the administration of extremely moderate doses of opium, in case of the sleeplessness, continuing after several hours. He had taken the precaution of bringing opium in his pocket, and he gave minute directions to Bulstrode as to the doses and the point at which they should cease. He insisted on the risk of not ceasing, and repeated his order that no alcohol should be given. "'From what I see of the case,' he ended, "'narcotism is the only thing I should be much afraid of.' He may wear through even without much food. There's a good deal of strength in him. You look ill yourself, Mr. Lydgate. A most unusual, I may say, unprecedented thing in my knowledge of you, said Bulstrode, showing a solicitude as unlike his indifference the day before as his present recklessness about his own fatigue was unlike his habitual self-cherishing anxiety. I fear you are harassed. Yes, I am, said Lydgate brusquely, holding his hat and ready to go. Something new, I fear— said Bulstrode. Pray you be seated. No, thank you, said Lydgate, with some hot air. I mentioned to you yesterday what was the state of my affairs. There is nothing to add except that the execution has since been actually put into my house. One can tell a good deal of trouble in a short sentence. I will say good morning. Stay, Mr. Lydgate, stay, said Bulstrode. I have been reconsidering this subject. I was yesterday taken by surprise, and saw it superficially. Mrs. Bulstrode is anxious for her niece, and I myself should grieve at a calamitous change in your position. Claims on me are numerous, but on reconsideration I esteem it right that I should incur a small sacrifice rather than leave you unaided. You said, I think, that a thousand pounds would suffice entirely to free you from your burdens, and enable you to recover a firm sand? Yes, said Lydgate, a great leap of joy within him surrounding every other feeling. That would pay all my debts, and leave me a little on hand. I could set about economising our way of living, and by and by my practice might look up. "'If you will wait a moment, Mr. Lydgate, I will draw a cheque to that amount. I am aware that help, to be effectual in these cases, should be thorough.' While Bulstrode wrote, Lydgate turned to the window, thinking of his home, thinking of his life, with its good start saved from frustration, its good purposes still unbroken. "'You can give me a note of hand for this, Mr. Lydgate,' said the banker, advancing towards him with the cheque, "'and by and by, I hope, you may be in circumstances gradually to repay me.' Meanwhile, I have the pleasure in thinking that you will be released from further difficulty. 
"'I am deeply obliged to you,' said Lydgate. "'You have restored to me the prospect of working with some happiness and some chance of good.' It appeared to him a very natural movement in Bulstrode that he should have reconsidered his refusal. It corresponded with the more munificent side of his character. But as he put his hack into a canter, that he might get the sooner home, and tell the good news to Rosemont, and get cash at the bank to pay over to Dover's agent, there crossed his mind, with an unpleasant impression as from a dark-winged flight of evil augury across his vision, the thought of that contrast in himself which a few months had brought— that he should be overjoyed at being under a strong personal obligation, that he should be overjoyed at getting money for himself from Bulstrode. The banker felt that he had done something to nullify one cause of uneasiness, and yet he was scarcely the easier. He did not measure the quantity of diseased motive which had made him wish for Lydgate's good will, but the quantity was none the less actively there, like an irritating agent in his blood. A man vows, and yet will not cast away the means of breaking his vow. Is it that he distinctly means to break it? Not at all. But the desires which tend to break it are at work in him dimly, and make their way into his imagination, and relax his muscles in the very movement when he is telling himself over again the reasons for his vow. Raffles, recovering quickly, returning to the free use of his odious powers, how could Bulstrode wish for that? Raffles dead was the image that brought release, and indirectly he prayed for that way of release— beseeching that if it were possible the rest of his days here below be freed from the threat of that ignominy which would break him utterly as an instrument of god's service lydgate's opinion was not on the side of promise that this prayer would be fulfilled and as the day advanced bulstrode felt himself getting irritated at the persistent life in this man whom he would fain have been sinking into the silence of death the imperious will stirred murderous impulses towards this brute life over which will by itself had no power he said inwardly that he was getting too much worn. He would not sit up with the patient to-night, but leave him to Mrs. Abel, who, if necessary, could call her husband. At six o'clock, Raffles, having had only fitful, perturbed snatches of sleep, from which he waked with fresh restlessness and perpetual cries that he was sinking away, Bulstrode began to administer the opium, according to Lydgate's directions. At the end of half an hour or more, he called Mrs. Abel, and told her that he found himself unfit for further watching. He must now consign the patient to her care, and he proceeded to repeat to her Lydgate's directions as to the quantity of each dose. Mrs. Abel had not before known anything of Lydgate's prescriptions. She had simply prepared and brought whatever Bulstrode ordered, and had done what he pointed out to her. She began now to ask what else she should do besides administering the opium. "'Nothing at present, except the offer of the soup or the soda-water. You can come to me for further directions. Unless there is any important change, I shall not come into the room again to-night. You will ask your husband for help, if necessary. I must go to bed early.' "'You've much need, sir, I'm sure,' said Mrs. Abel, "'and to take something more strengthening than what you've done.' Bulstrode went away now, without anxiety as to what Raffles might say in his raving, which had taken on a muttering incoherence not likely to create any dangerous belief. He went down into the wainscoted parlour first, and began to consider whether he would not have his horse saddled and go home by the moonlight, and give up caring for earthly consequences. Then he wished that he had begged Lydgate to come again that evening. Perhaps he might deliver a different opinion, and think that Raffles was getting into a less hopeful state. Should he send for Lydgate? If Raffles were really getting worse, and slowly dying, Bulstrode felt that he could go to bed and sleep in gratitude to Providence. But was he worse? Lydgate might come and simply say that he was going on as expected, and predict that he would, by and by, fall into a good sleep and get well. What was the use of sending for him? Bulstrode shrank from that result. No ideas or opinions could hinder him from seeing the one probability to be that Raffles recovered would be just the same man as before, with his strength as a tormentor renewed, obliging him to drag away his wife to spend her years apart from her friends and native place, carrying an alienating suspicion against him in her heart. He had sat an hour and a half in this conflict by the firelight only, when a sudden thought made him rise and light the bed-candle, which he had brought down with him. The thought was that he had not told Mrs. Abel when the doses of opium must cease. He took hold of the candlestick, but stood motionless for a long while. She might already have given him more than Lydgate had prescribed, but it was excusable in him that he should forget part of an order, in his present wearied condition. He walked upstairs, candle in hand, not knowing whether he should straightway enter his own room and go to bed, or turn to the patient's room and rectify his omission. He paused in the passage, with his face turned towards Raffles' room, and he could hear him moaning and murmuring. He was not asleep, then. 
who could know that Lydgate's prescription would not be better disobeyed than followed, since there was still no sleep? He turned into his own room. Before he had quite undressed, Mrs. Abel rapped at the door. He opened it an inch, so that he could hear her speak low. "'If you please, sir, should I have no brandy nor nothing to give the poor creature? He feels sinking away, and nothing else will he swallow. And but little strength in it if he did, only the opium, and he says more and more he's sinking down through the earth. To her surprise, Bulstrode did not answer. A struggle was going on within him. "'I think he must die for want of support if he goes on in that way. When I nursed my poor master, Mr. Robinson, I had to give him port wine and brandy constant, and a big glass at a time,' added Mrs. Abel, with a touch of remonstrance in her tone. But again Mr. Bulstrode did not answer immediately, and she continued, "'It's not time to spare when people are at death's door, nor would you wish it, sir, I'm sure, else I should give him your own bottle of rum as we keep by us.' but a sitter-up as you've been, and doing everything as laid in your power. Here a key was thrust through the inch of doorway, and Mr. Bulstrode said huskily, That is the key to the wine-cooler. You will find plenty of brandy there. Early in the morning, about six, Mr. Bulstrode rose, and spent some time in prayer. Does any one suppose that private prayer is necessarily candid, necessarily goes to the roots of action? Private prayer is an audible speech, and speech is representative. Who can represent himself just as he is? even in his own reflections. Bulstrode had not yet unravelled in his thought the confused promptings of the last four-and-twenty hours. He listened in the passage, and could hear hard, stertorous breathing. Then he walked out in the garden, and looked at the early rime on the grass and fresh spring leaves. When he re-entered the house, he felt startled at the sight of Mrs. Abel. "'How is your patient? Asleep, I think?' he said, with an attempt at cheerfulness in his tone. "'He's gone very deep, sir.' said Mrs. Abel. He went off gradual between three and four o'clock. Would you please to go and look at him? I thought it no harm to leave him. My man's gone afield, and the little girl's seen to the kettles. Bulstrode went up. At a glance he knew that Raffles was not in the sleep which brings revival, but in the sleep which streams deeper and deeper into the gulf of death. He looked round the room, and saw a bottle with some brandy in it, and the almost empty opium phial. He put the file out of sight, and carried the brandy bottle downstairs with him, locking it again in the wine-cooler. While breakfasting he considered whether he should ride to Middlemarch at once, or wait for Lydgate's arrival. He decided to wait, and told Mrs. Abel that she might go about her work. He could watch in the bedchamber. As he sat there, and beheld the enemy of his peace going irrevocably into silence, he felt more at rest than he had done for many months. His conscience was soothed by the enfolding wing of secrecy, which seemed just then like an angel sent down for his relief. He drew out his pocket-book, to review various memoranda there as to the arrangements he had projected, and partly carried out in the prospect of quitting Middlemarch, and considered how far he would let them stand or recall them, now that his absence would be brief. Some economies which he felt desirable might still find a suitable occasion in his temporary withdrawal from management, and he hoped still that Mrs. Casbon would take a large share in the expenses of the hospital. In that way the moments passed, until a change in the stertorous breathing was marked enough to draw his attention wholly to the bed, and forced him to think of the departing life, which had once been subservient to his own, which he had once been glad to find base enough for him to act on as he would. It was his gladness, then, which impelled him now to be glad that the life was at an end. And who could say that the death of Raffles had been hastened? Who knew what would have saved him? Lydgate arrived at half-past ten, in time to witness the final pause of the breath. When he entered the room, Bulstrode observed a sudden expression in his face, which was not so much surprise as a recognition that he had not judged correctly. He stood by the bed in silence for some time, with his eyes turned on the dying man, but with that subdued activity of expression which showed that he was carrying on an inward debate. "'When did this change begin?' said he, looking at Bulstrode. "'I did not watch by him last night,' said Bulstrode. "'I was overworn. I left him under Mrs. Abel's care. She said that he sank into sleep between three and four o'clock. When I came in before eight he was nearly in this condition.' Lydgate did not ask another question, but watched in silence until he said, "'It is all over.' This morning Lydgate was in a state of recovered hope and freedom. He had set out on his work with all his old animation, and felt himself strong enough to bear all the deficiencies of his married life and he was conscious that Bulstrode had been a benefactor to him. But he was uneasy about this case. He had not expected it to terminate as it had done. Yet he hardly knew how to put a question on the subject to Bulstrode without appearing to insult him, and if he examined the housekeeper, 
Why, the man was dead. There seemed to be no use in implying that anybody's ignorance or imprudence had killed him, and, after all, he himself might be wrong. He and Bulstrode rode back to Middlemarch together, talking of many things, chiefly cholera and the chances of the Reform Bill in the House of Lords, and the firm resolve of the political unions. Nothing was said about Raffles, except that Bulstrode mentioned the necessity of having a grave for him in Lowick Churchyard, and observed that, so far as he knew, the poor man had no connections, except Rigg, whom he had stated to be unfriendly towards him. On returning home, Lydgate had a visit from Mr. Fairbrother. The vicar had not been in the town the day before, but the news that there was an execution in Lydgate's house had got to Lowick by the evening, having been carried by Mr. Spicer, shoemaker and parish clerk, who had it from his brother, the respectable bell-hanger in Lowick Gate. Since that evening, when Lydgate had come down from the billiard-room with Fred Vincey, Mr. Fairbrother's thoughts about him had been rather gloomy. Playing at the Green Dragon once or oftener might have been a trifle in another man, but in Lydgate it was one of several signs that he was getting unlike his former self. He was beginning to do things for which he had formerly even an excessive scorn. Whatever certain dissatisfactions in marriage, which some silly tinklings of gossip had given him hints of, might have to do with this change, Mr. Fairbrother felt sure that it was chiefly connected with the debts which were being more and more distinctly reported and he began to fear that any notion of Lydgate's having resources or friends in the background must be quite illusory. The rebuff he had met with in his first attempt to win Lydgate's confidence disinclined him to a second, but this news of the execution being actually in the house determined the vicar to overcome his reluctance. Lydgate had just dismissed a poor patient in whom he was much interested, and he came forward to put out his hand with an open cheerfulness which surprised Mr. Fairbrother. Could this, too, be a proud rejection of sympathy and help? Never mind. The sympathy and help should be offered. "'How are you, Lydgate? I came to see you because I had heard something which made me anxious about you,' said the vicar, in the tone of a good brother, only that there was no reproach in it. They were both seated by this time, and Lydgate answered immediately. "'I think I know what you mean. You had heard that there was an execution in the house?' "'Yes. Is it true?' "'It was true,' said Lydgate, with an air of freedom, as if he did not mind talking about the affair now. "'But the danger is over. The debt is paid. And I am out of my difficulties now. I shall be freed from debts, and able, I hope, to start afresh on a better plan.' "'I am very thankful to hear it,' said the vicar, falling back in his chair and speaking with that low-toned quickness, which often follows the removal of a load. "'I like that better than all the news in the Times. I confess I came to you with a heavy heart.' "'Thank you for coming,' said Lydgate cordially. "'I can enjoy the kindness all the more, because I am happier. "'I have certainly been a good deal crushed. "'I am afraid I shall find the bruises still painful by and by,' he added, smiling rather sadly. "'But just now I can only feel that the torture screw is off.' Mr. Fairbrother was silent for a moment, and then said earnestly, "'My dear fellow, let me ask you one question. "'Forgive me if I take a liberty. "'I don't believe you will ask me anything that ought to offend me. "'Then it, this is necessary to set my heart quite at rest. "'You have not, have you?' in order to pay your debts, incurred another debt, which may harass you worse hereafter? No, said Lydgate, colouring slightly. There is no reason why I should not tell you, since the fact is so, that the person to whom I am indebted is Bulstrode. He has made me a very handsome advance, a thousand pounds, and he can afford to wait for repayment. Well, that is generous, said Fairbrother, compelling himself to approve of the man whom he disliked. His delicate feeling shrank from dwelling even in his thought on the fact that he had always urged Lydgate to avoid any personal entanglement with Bulstrode. He added immediately, "'And Bulstrode must naturally feel an interest in your welfare, after you have worked with him in a way which has probably reduced your income instead of adding to it. I am glad to think that he has acted accordingly.' Lydgate felt uncomfortable under these kindly suppositions. They made more distinct within him the uneasy consciousness which had shown its first dim stirrings only a few hours before, that Bulstrode's motives for his sudden beneficence following close upon the chillest indifference might be merely selfish. He let the kindly supposition pass. He could not tell the history of the loan, but it was more vividly present with him than ever, as well as the fact which the vicar delicately ignored, that this relation of personal indebtedness to Bulstrode was what he had once been most resolved to avoid. He began, instead of answering, to speak of his projected economies, and of his having come to look at his life from a different point of view. "'I shall set up a surgery,' he said. "'I really think I made a mistaken effort in that respect, and, if Rosamond will not mind, I shall take an apprentice. I don't like these things, but if one carries them out faithfully, they are not really lowering. I have had a severe galling to begin with. That will make the small rub seem easy.' 
for lydgate the if rosamond will not mind which had fallen from him involuntarily as part of his thought was a significant mark of the yoke he bore but mr fairbrother whose hopes entered strongly into the same current with lydgate's and who knew nothing about him that could now raise a melancholy presentiment left him with affectionate congratulation End of chapter seventy